Okay, so I guess it is uh, 9, uh, 9 a.m. here in uh, Philadelphia. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our workshop on equivariance and uh, data augmentation. So this is uh, Edgar, one of the uh, co-organizers, and this is uh, organized with uh, Kostas um, Danielidis from Computer and Information Science. So um, we have uh, um, uh, over uh, actually 500 uh, research participants, and right now uh, there's about uh, 100 of them uh, who are who are att attending. And of course, this is a full day workshop, so the number of attendees will change over time. So the protocol is that um, you can ask questions via the QA button, and uh, myself, I will relay the question to the panelists. I don't expect the panelists to necessarily follow the Q and A uh, during the during the during their talk. So, um, and it will be either at the end or uh, of the talk or during the talk, depending on what they what they uh, prefer. So, let me hand it over uh, to uh, Kostas for a few remarks. Yes, good morning. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, everybody, and thanks for uh, res registering and uh, joining. Uh, uh, this is, uh, we are very excited uh, about uh, uh, the topic, and uh, we have an amazing list of uh, speakers whom I would like all to thank for uh, volunteering uh, <coughs> uh, on a Friday after several conferences, actually, where with uh, tens of workshops. Uh, and I hope also that uh, uh, some of uh, this uh, also will be at some point uh, repeated uh, uh, next year and that uh, we somehow create also a series of uh, workshops. Um, should I introduce Haggai or? Uh, I, I can introduce uh, yeah, okay. uh, Haggai. So our, very, our first speaker is, um, we're very excited to have Haggai Maron uh, from uh, NVIDIA Research. Uh, where he is a research scientist. He completed his PhD in 2019 and is uh, well known for his work on uh, 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 learning with uh, various symmetric uh, structures. In particular, his work was awarded uh, the ICML Pondicani Outstanding Paper Award. So this is you know, just a few months ago. It's really exciting to have him. Please, uh, Hagai, uh, you can uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um... Let me just move to full screen mode. Let me, is it okay now? Okay, great. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank the organizers. Uh, this is really an amazing uh, 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 workshop. I'm very happy to be, uh, to be invited and to speak here. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, how to leverage permutation group symmetries for designing equivariant neural networks. Um, this will summarize some of the uh, uh, some of my work and my colleagues' work in uh, in the last uh, two or three years. Um, and I want to start with uh, stating the goal uh, for this uh, talk. So, in general, we are going to assume that we have um, an element X in R n and we, that we already know what is the symmetry group that we are interested in. And in this talk, we are going to concentrate or focus on uh, symmetry groups, which are permutation groups, meaning that they are subgroup of the permutation uh, of the permutations. And our goal is to construct useful equivariant or invariant models for this scenario. Um, I want to uh, quickly go over two of the um, most well-known examples of this setup. Uh, the first one is, of course, uh, the case in which uh, H models translations. And in this case, H is a cyclic group and, or, or a product of cyclic groups. And uh, what we use is uh, convolutional neural networks or CNNs. And we can see on the right side uh, the structure of a single matrix that represents a convolutional neural network. We will see that this structure is going to be connected to the equivariance properties for uh, not only this group, but all groups. Uh, the second example is the case in which X represents a set. We don't care about the order of the elements. And in this case, H is the whole uh, 
permutation group, all the symmetry group, and in this case, uh, the uh, correct or the most general thing to do is to use the deep sets architecture uh, from uh, uh, several years ago. And the big question is going to be what should we do uh, if we have some general permutation group H, not something like like uh, uh, whole uh, the whole symmetry uh, whole symmetry group or uh, uh, cyclic uh, translations, which we know how to solve. Okay, so the outline is as follows. I'm going to discuss a notion which uh, I call symmetry-induced parameter sharing. Uh, and then I'm going to show you two examples of using this uh, uh, notion or this approach for designing equivariant neural networks. The first would be how to use this approach for uh, learning on graphs. And the second one is how to uh, use was this approach for uh, learning sets of uh, complex elements or uh, sets of uh, symmetric elements. Okay, so we will start with a quick, by quickly overviewing some uh, mathematical uh, uh, notation and uh, preliminaries. So as I said, we are going to, to uh, talk about permutation groups and permutation actions. Um, they actually, although this is not like the most general thing, uh, this is pretty useful. Um, of course, permutations can act on vectors by permuting the elements of the vector, and they can be used to model a lot of natural transformations. So for instance, transformations on images can be thought of as a subgroup of the permutation groups. We just shuffle the um, uh, pixels in a certain way, and of course, uh, when in X encodes a set, uh, we can think about uh, permutations that shuffle the uh, uh, vectors that represent the set. Um, so uh, the notion of invariance is pretty simple. We have a group and the function is called invariant if applying any element of the group tau uh, does not change the output of the function. Function. And a good example for that is image classification. So uh, for instance, here, it doesn't matter if we uh, change, we apply a translation to the image, we get exactly the same uh, output. In this case, this is a label. Uh, equivariance is pretty similar. Actually, this is a more general term that uh, generalizes invariance. And uh, here, again, we have H. Uh, subgroup and a function is called equivariant in case it commutes with uh, all the elements in the group. And I think that a good example for equivariant functions is an edge detector on an image. Uh, <clears throat> so let me illustrate that. It doesn't matter if I first I translate the image and then apply an edge detector or vice versa. We get exactly the same thing. And there's a very popular way uh, to construct invariant neural networks. And it goes as follows. We are going to concatenate several equivariant layers, one after the other, with uh, activation functions between them, then apply an invariant function. And then, uh, if we want, we can apply a fully connected network. Uh, so this is very similar to what people do with images, with the CNNs, uh, the uh, convolutional layers are equivariant to translations, and I think that this is the big motivation uh, between, uh, behind this uh, uh, construction. This can be easily shown to be a, an invariant function. Okay, so what are the main challenges uh, that we have if we have this symmetry group H and we want to construct an invariant or an equivariant uh, network. So if we use this construction, what we need to know is only what are the equivariant layers and the invariant layers. And then we can uh, uh, construct the network. So the first challenge is uh, characterizing the space of linear equivariant layers for a specific group H. The second one is a bit more intricate. Uh, when we um, 
take a fully connected layer and, redu and, and uh, uh, make it an equivalent layer, what we do is actually we reduce the uh, expressive power of this layer and reduce the expressive power of the network in general. And uh, what we would like to do is to understand whether we got a network that has some uh, expressive power. So here in the green ellipse, we can see it depicts the, the set of all continuous functions. Uh, the middle ellipse in blue shows us the class of all H invariant continuous functions. Those are functions that we are interested in, that we would like to approximate. Um, and inside in the inner ellipse, we can see uh, the class of H invariant networks. Those are functions that be, can be approximated by uh, the invariant networks that we have just discussed. And the question is whether there is a gap between those two inner ellipses. Uh, so, so, for example, one can construct a very simple equivariant or invariant layer that a network that just uh, outputs one for anything, for any input, but of course that this is not interesting. So we want to reduce the expressive power to uh, invariant functions, but we don't want to reduce it too much. Okay. Uh, and what we're going to do now is to try to explore the connection between equivariance and parameter sharing, which means that some uh, uh, parameters in our parameter matrix uh, are actually represented by the same parameters. So we're going to assume that our layers have this affine um, uh, form, uh, uh, Ax plus b, where a is a linear operator and some um, nonlinearity on top of it. And the big question here is, what should be the structure of a if we want a to b to represent an equivariant linear operator? This brings us to a very nice notion uh, called uh, H-induced parameter sharing. So this is maybe the most important definition of this talk, uh, and it gives us a way to uh, construct a parameter sharing scheme for a specific subgroup H of the permutation matrices. So again, A here is an N by N operator that acts on our uh, uh, vectors, which are uh, uh, vectors in Rn, and we want to understand what is the structure of A for, in order for it to be equivariant. So first of all, we define this parameter sharing scheme. It says that the ij entry in A and the kl entry in A should be the same, meaning that they should re be represented by the same, exactly the same parameter, if and only if there is some parameter, some element of H tau that takes i to k and j to l. By using this uh, definition, we can uh, uh, discuss maybe the most important uh, theorem of this, uh, of this talk, which states the following. If I want a maximal linear equivariant operator, the only thing that I should do is to understand and apply the parameter sharing scheme that it is induced by H. This is, a, this gives me the most general um, equivalent operators. Uh, so this is a very nice uh, result, I think, because it gives us uh, a recipe. Given an H, a uh, subgroup H, what are all the equivariant operators, the linear op equivariant operators for this H. So let's see some examples and it will be clearer. The first example is uh, when H represents translations. Uh, so it is just a cyclic group with N elements and the uh, addition is modulo N. So let's say that I start with the one, two entry. Um, and uh, now I, I'm trying to recover the parameter sharing scheme for this specific H. So we saw that what we can do is apply tau to each one of the indices and see what happens. So if I apply a translation by a single step, then I can get T 
to two, three. If I do that again, I get this and this and this. So all these uh, entries in the matrix share exactly the same parameter. And if we do this uh, in a similar way, the other entries, we will recover this structure, which we all know as a convolution matrix. So this is nice. Uh, we know that convolutions are the equivariant of uh, linear equivariant operators for uh, translations. And now we recover this, uh, this uh, structure by using our theorem. Let's go to another example. In this case, H is SN, the symmetric group. And one can notice that uh, by applying a group element to the diagonal, you can go only to the diagonal, right? If I have the one, one entry, and then I apply tau, I get tau of one and tau of one, and they have to be the same because tau is a function. So the whole diagonal would be, it would have the, the exactly the same uh, parameter. And in a similar way, maybe it's a bit more uh, uh, difficult to see, but uh, you can trust me. Uh, if we go to an uh, off-diagonal element, we can actually move by the action of H to any off-diagonal element. So this is pretty nice. We started with uh, n-squared parameters and we ended up with uh, two parameters. This is the most general form of equivariant operators uh, for SN. Okay, the last example is trivial. In this case, H is the uh, trivial group. And in this case, we don't have any parameter sharing. And this is just a fully connected network. Um, okay, so let me now uh, show you how to use this in order to build uh, networks for uh, more sof sophisticated H's that we encounter in, uh, in reality. Um, so the first thing we, we will do is to try to use it in order to uh, construct networks that can be applied to graphs. And uh, needless to say, graph learning is a hot topic today, uh, very popular and for good reasons because um, graphs uh, are extremely useful at uh, representing a lot of real world uh, phenomena and objects like 3D shapes and molecules and social networks and scenes and images and many other. Okay, so um, I want you to think about a supervised learning um, setup with graphs. I get a graph and I need to find a function that can map this graph to a specific label maybe the first thing we should think about is how to represent graphs. And I think that the simplest way to do that is by an adjacency-like structure. So on the left side, we can see a graph. On the right side, we can see an adjacency matrix that represents this graph. On the diagonal, we can see the node uh, features. On the off-diagonal, we can see the connectivity. Of course, this uh, representation can have multiple channels. And uh, this is uh, uh, a good representation for graphs. Uh, another thing we can do is to represent hypergraphs by using higher order tensors. In this case, this is a third order tensor and we can uh, represent uh, high order edges as well, but we restrict ourselves in this talk to uh, regular graphs. Okay, so we know that our uh, object of interest is a graph and it is represented by this adjacency matrix and we want to discover the symmetries. What are those um, uh, transformations that we don't care about when we deal with graphs? And I think that the uh, 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 answer to that is pretty simple. Uh, so here is an example. We have two isomorphic graphs. Those are essentially the same graphs, those two graphs, but they have different adjacency structure. This is because the structure is, uh, depends on the specific order of the nodes. So what we want to be invariant or equivariant to is the specific order of the nodes. 
And mathematically speaking, this can be formulated in the following way. Uh, so two graphs are the same if there is a permutation matrix that is multiplied, that we can multiply uh, the rows and the columns of the adjacency matrix and get exactly the same uh, adjacency structure. And we will use this shorter notation um, during this talk. Okay, so equivariance in the case of graphs uh, is actually the following. We have the set of, uh, okay, our input is n by n matrices. You can think about it as n squared vectors. And the general group that we are dealing with here is Sn squared, but actually we are interested in a subgroup H, which is isomorphic to Sn, a symmetric group on n elements. This group only changes the order of the nodes or the columns and the rows in the same way. Equivariance in this way means that we're looking for operators, linear operators, that um, commute with this action, exactly as we see here in this uh, illustration. It doesn't matter if I first apply tau, which changes the adjacency structure, and then apply L, or if I do it vice versa. And by applying the theorem that I just showed you, we can uh, get pretty amazing result. Uh, so what we see here is a specific and color encoding of a parameter matrix for graphs. So I remind you that graphs are n squared uh, vectors. And uh, for this reason, this linear operator is from uh, is n squared by n squared matrix. Uh, what we have here is only 15 parameters, and this is independent of the size of the graph. And in the paper itself, we show that we can actually uh, apply this uh, layer to uh, graphs of different sizes, which is a crucial property for uh, dealing with real-life uh, graphs. Okay, so cool. We applied our uh, theorem and got a specific um, uh, form for equivariant layers for graphs, which is the most general form for linear layers. And now we want to ask questions about the expressivity of the networks that we can construct from these layers. So we have this nice um, result that uh, states that we can represent any message passing neural network to an ar arbitrary precision. So message passing neural networks are maybe uh, the most popular models today for uh, learning on graphs. And what this uh, theorem says is that um, we, are, uh, we are able to capture their expressive power. And actually uh, there has been uh, some, some nice developments and people have shown that the expressive power of uh, our networks uh, the equivariant, graph equivariant networks and uh, message passing neural networks is exactly the same. Uh, I want to add that this is not the full expressive power that we can have with uh, uh, graph networks. Uh, and in order to get more expressive graph networks, we can do several things that we explored in, in other papers last year. The first one is to uh, use polynomial equivariant layers instead of linear equivariant layers. And we show that this uh, helps to improve expressivity. The se second thing is to use high order tensors as I showed you earlier. So you can actually show that if you use very, very high, ten uh, high order tensors, then you can get a universal uh, networks that can approximate any uh, continuous uh, graph invariant function. Okay, so this was the first uh, example. I want to move on to the second one. The second one deals with our recent ICML paper. And in this case, we're interested in, in learning on sets, but differently from previous papers, we will assume that the elements of the set have their own symmetries uh, as well. Okay, so let's uh, um, 
try to understand what people did before. Uh, previous works, uh, amazing papers, in my opinion, deep sets and point net, uh, and some other papers as well, they dealt with the case in which um, the input set is a set of feature vectors or uh, 3D coordinates, but they didn't assume any structure or uh, any symmetry structure on the uh, set elements. And this is the main thing that, uh, that is different in our work. So the main question is, again, what is the architecture that is optimal when uh, the elements of the set have their own symmetries? Let's try to illustrate what that means. So let's uh, think about a simple task that takes multiple input images of the same scene. Uh, they are uh, corrupted, they might have some noise or blur, and we want to output a, a, high, a single high quality image. So in this case, we actually have two kinds of symmetries going on. The first one is the set symmetry, which means that if I shuffle the input images, I want to get exactly the same uh, output as, in, as I got earlier. So this is kind of an invariance to uh, the order of the set. And the second symmetry is the element-wise symmetry, which means that if I apply a translation to each one of the images, I want the translation to be applied to the output as well. Um, so the case of sets of images and the output of a single image is just uh, a single example. There are actually multiple scenarios in which we have this uh, situation, and not only in images, in 1D signals, and in point clouds and graphs. Um, and this is uh, uh, the general setup that we try to deal with. OK, so uh, formally, the setup is the following. We assume that we have uh, n elements, x1 till xn, in Rd. And they have their own symmetry group G, which is again a subgroup of the symmetry group of D elements. And we want to be invariant or equivariant to both G and the ordering of the elements themselves. And formally, we can define the symmetry group as H, which is a product of Sn and G. So Sn acts on the rows of this uh, matrix, this input matrix that holds all the elements, and G, oh, sorry, oh, yeah, XN acts on the rows, and G acts on the columns. So, sorry to interrupt, there's about three minutes uh, on the formal time. Yeah. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, so uh, the first theorem uh, characterizes this is the set of all of the space of all equivariant operators on this setup. And it actually says that we can apply a single G equivariant uh, uh, function to each Xi. And we need to add the sum of another G equivariant operator L2 to the other elements. Let's try to understand what it means on images. So, what we can do in the case of images is to apply a single convolution in a CMEs way, actually, to each image. And uh, in addition, we can use another uh, uh, way which sums all the images together and applies a different convolution to this, uh, uh, to this sum. And then we have to sum them up together. So uh, the DSS layer actually means that we have a CIDMIS part and an information sharing part uh, in each layer. Okay, and from the point of view of parameter sharing, this is how it looks like. We have uh, one convolution on the diagonal and uh, another convolution on the off-diagonal. Uh, as before, we are interested in the expressive power and we have nice results regarding the expressive power of those G equivariant networks. Um, okay, so let me conclude. Uh, first of all, as, as, as we all know, uh, 
architectures of structured objects can benefit from taking into account the underlying symmetries. And uh, want, what I want to, to emphasize uh, from my talk is that in the case of permutation actions, it boils down to parameter sharing schemes, which I think is a very beautiful uh, um, phenomenon. And the last thing is we, that we need to pay attention to the explosivity when we do that. So uh, this is the end of the talk, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is this uh, list of relevant papers and my amazing collaborators. And I want also to uh, point, point out uh, some very, very related papers by Siama Kravan uh that is working on this topic as well. So if you're interested, uh, please read his papers as well. I think uh, they're very good. Thank you very much. Um, very, uh, very nice talk. A few quick questions from uh, so one from Simon Bessner. Uh, does the parameter sharing scheme translate beyond permutation to continuous groups? So there's been an answer by Paco uh, on the chat saying not really, but maybe if you can elaborate on that. Um, yes, so the answer is that I, I'm not aware of a, of a way to do that. It would be awesome to do that, but uh, I don't know how to do that currently. I don't think that it, it not in a simple way. Uh, and another quick question from Hans Ries. Uh, could you elaborate on what you mean by expressive power? Like what is a little bit more rigorously the statement of the theorem? Oh, so uh, in general, uh, if we restrict our models to be invariant and equivariant, we are uh, interested in the ability of these models to uh, approximate uh, continuous invariant or equivariant functions. Uh, we want to be uh, careful here and not to construct models that are not uh, expressive enough for uh, what we want to, um, to what we want the functions that we want to learn. So I think that it is uh, important when uh, you try to devise when you devise a new model uh, invariant or equivariant model. Uh, to try to understand if you reduced the capacity or the expressive power of the model too much. And actually, this is not just a, 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 you know, a theoretical question. In the case of graphs, this, is, this actually happens. So graph networks, as I described, are not uh, universal. They, they cannot approximate any uh, continuous function on graphs, which is interesting, and a lot of people are working on this topic in order to find more expressive uh, uh, networks. So, uh, I guess another quick question from uh, David Hong. Quick clarification is it same that DSS captures a setting where every image has the same translation? And I think the answer is yes. Yeah, right. Um, so, this is, um, this is right. We, uh, the, this is what gives rise to the uh, a product of the group's uh, formulation. Uh, there is a recent paper by Siamak that uh, deals uh, with uh, um, uh, another kind of product, which is called the wreath product of, of the two groups, which is relevant for different translations. And actually, in our DSS paper as well, we uh, also characterize the equivariant layers for this case. So both of the cases are interesting. I think it depends on the actual um, uh, application that we want to use them for. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So, uh, then let us move to the next uh, speaker.